It's funny how some images could just stick in your head. It was November 20th, 1983, and ABC aired a made-for-TV movie entitled The Day After. It featured a, a bunch of people in Kansas City trying to survive a nuclear attack. A hundred million different people tuned in to watch this. 39 million different households. It was the seventh highest rated non-sporting event in television history. On November 20th, 1983, I was a six-year-old boy living in Milwaukee. My dad was finishing up his last year of seminary, and I don't remember a lot about that year. I remember we lived in an old white farmhouse. I remember it was drafty. I remember the basement was creepy. I remember the bus driver never, remind me, never remembered to drop me off at the right driveway. But outside of that, I couldn't tell you a lot about that year of my life, but I, I remember watching this. I remember sitting there as a six-year-old boy watching this on her living room floor, and I don't think I even knew nuclear war was a thing. I couldn't have told you anything about the Cold War. And up until this moment, it never occurred to me that everything I had in my life could be taken away by an, in an instant. Like I said, I, I can't remember much about that year. There's no way I could take any of the memories I have and put them into any kind of a conceivable timeline. But I remember this. Isn't it funny how some images just stick in your head? Well, in Daniel 2, we find a young Nebuchadnezzar. He's at the beginning of his reign, and it seems like the sky is the limit. I mean, who knows how far this empire thing was going to go? Who knows what he could accomplish and what he could do? Then he goes to sleep one night, and he sees this. And he couldn't get it out of his head. The next morning he wakes up and he calls in his advisors. He tells them he wants to know what the dream meant. But, you know, he's a smart enough guy to know how easy it is for advisors to try to flatter you. How easy it was for them to give him an interpretation that would pump up his ego and make him feel good about himself. And he wasn't interested in flattery. He wanted the truth. And so he told them not only did they have to tell him what the dream meant, but they had to tell him what the dream was. They got to admit, it's a great way to make sure people don't lie to you. You also have to admit it's impossible. And when his advisors told him that they couldn't do it, that there's no way they could tell him what the dream was and what it meant, he decided to put all of them to death. Now Daniel wasn't in the room that day. He didn't have a chance to talk to the king, but he was a part of the cast of advisors. And so the executioners came to find him. And Daniel asked him for one night. Not because they had any idea what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. But because he knew he had a God who revealed mysteries. A God who knew the future, who held it in the palm of his hand. And so he went to sleep that night. And the images that danced before Nebuchadnezzar's mind danced before Daniel's. And the next morning he got up and this is what he said. This was a dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he's placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he's made you rule over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Never before had someone been shown so much of the future. 
I mean, there God showed Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel the beginning and end of his very own empire. He was that head of gold. And then he showed them the next one, the one that would come to power when Daniel was still serving the kingdom of the Persians. We heard about him last week with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. But God kept going. He told them about the Greeks. He told them about the Romans. They saw the rise and fall of the great kingdoms of the history of the earth. Great events, great people, great battles, great victories. He saw their beginning and their end. But that's not, I'm guessing, what kept him up at night. What must have played on his head, what must have bothered Nebuchadnezzar, was that rock. Daniel continues. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. You see, the star of the show is not any of those kingdoms. It's that rock. That kingdom that, that this rock symbolizes that is built but not by human hands. This kingdom that would never be destroyed, that would never change hands. A kingdom that would grow and fill the whole earth and would last forever. That would bring every other kingdom to an end so that in the end all their accomplishments and all of their great victories are nothing more than dust in the wind. You see, that must have been the part that bothered Nebuchadnezzar the most. Because it upends everything we consider to be things of substance. I mean, there in that dream, he saw the whole thing. He saw the rise and fall of nation after nation, kingdom after kingdom. He saw great events and great victories and great people and the great accomplishments of mankind. All the stuff we memorize in history class. All the stuff we think of as being things of substance that will last and endure and stand the test of time. And yet there he sees them. He sees their beginning and their end. He sees them disappear like dust in the wind. I mean, the dream, it just goes over all of it. It doesn't say a thing about Xerxes or Artaxerxes of the Persians. It doesn't say a thing about Alexander the Great or Caesar Augustus. It doesn't say a thing about the Greek phalanx or the Roman legion. It doesn't mention anything about the Great Wall of China, the Eiffel Tower, or anybody walking on the moon. It jumps past all of our great accomplishments. It shows that in the end, they're just dust. Like the leaves that are on your lawn today and your neighbor's problem tomorrow. See, it doesn't matter what age you live in. It doesn't matter where you live or what you accomplish or what you do in your life. At some point, everything you see around you, it all disappears like dust in the wind. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. It matters. You see, this is your country, your state, your community, your church, your people, your family, your friends, and how you live here, how you serve each other here, how you serve your neighbors and your community and your family and your friends and the members of your church. This is how you show your God what it looks like to love as he's loved you. What we do here matters. But it's not our future. If you and I think that it's our accomplishments that will build our legacy... If you and I think that it's this or that policy or this or that victory or this or that accomplishment of life that we can count on that's going to guarantee that you and I are safe moving into the future, you and I are going to find that we have no future. Because at some point, everything you see around you will be gone. Like dust in the wind. You see, the key to your future is not found in any of those kingdoms you saw in that statue or any of the ones who have come up since. It's found in that rock. 
And there's only one kingdom that matches that description. A kingdom that's not built by human hands. A kingdom that brings an end to all the others. A rise and fall of great nations. Ultimately, it crafts the whole thing according to its own desire. A kingdom that will never change hands, will endure forever, and will cover the globe. There's only one that fits that description. And Daniel was not the first to see it. Do you remember what David said 500 years earlier? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. You see, God promised that he was going to send someone who would be the cornerstone, who would establish a kingdom that, that would span the globe and the centuries that would endure forever. And so often the people of Israel wished it would be their nation and their kings, but the kings always failed and the people strayed, and that kingdom changed hands more times than you can count. But it wasn't just senseless destruction. God didn't just raise up one kingdom and get rid of another just for the sake of wrecking stuff. He was building something. You see, through the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, kingdom after kingdom, ruler after ruler, victory after victory, and defeat after defeat, God was crafting the perfect time. So that finally there'd be a guy named Caesar Augustus who in some place called Rome would demand that everybody be counted. And there'd be this young family that has to make their way to a town called Bethlehem. And there, they're the cornerstone. There that child would be born. And just as it says, he would face rejection constantly. I mean, when he was just a kid, Herod tried to kill him. They had to run to Egypt. And the rest of his life, wherever he preached, wherever he taught, wherever he went, there was always opposition. In fact, do you know how Jesus describes his life at the end of his life in Luke 20? He says, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. You see, Jesus knew what he was here for. He knew that he'd be rejected. He knew he'd be arrested and nailed to a cross. He knew he himself would face destruction. But he was building something. You see, rocks, they're not always pretty. But they are solid, aren't they? And they are perfect for building on. Jesus came to be something that you can build on. And it started by him paying the price for your sin by him being rejected and nailed to that cross in your place and mine so he could buy you for himself, make you a people that are never going to pass out of memory, but a people that will endure forever, no matter where you live and when you live and what flag it is that flies over you. We're a part of a kingdom that endures. You see, that stone came to give us a future. And do you know what Peter says? He says, now we're a part of that. In 1 Peter 2, he writes, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You see, in the waters of your baptism, you were bolted into that rock. Through the power of God's word, through promise after promise, God has made you a part of that rock. He has made you his own. And those are promises that will never let you down, that will never pass away like dust in the wind because nothing can stop God from doing what he promises to do. You see, God has made you a part of that rock. He's made you a part of his kingdom. And there, there you have a future. One that will never let you down. You know, at the end of that dream, it's got this picture of the rock that just grows and grows and grows and it fills the whole earth. And that's exactly what happened. This is a map of the growth of the Christian church from the time of the Romans. And this is just where we can see evidence of the Christian church spreading 
thousands of years later. I mean, who knows how far it got, but it's been around the world more times than you can count. But do you ever think about it? Do you ever think about how it was at some point there's someone just like you in northern Africa or in Kazakhstan holding on to the same God, the same promises, who through the waters of baptism are bolted into the very same rock. And their nation has come and gone. Maybe we don't even realize their people ever existed, but they do. To this day they live. Because you and I have a rock that endures forever. On and on that kingdom grows and it spreads. It fills the whole earth. And you're a part of it. You know, it's funny what images stick in your head, isn't it? It's amazing how I, I can still remember watching that movie, seeing that, that nuclear blast as a kid. It never occurred to me that everything you have in your life could, could just be taken away in a moment. And you know, I hope and pray that we've got a lot of good years left. Because this is our people, it's our country, it's our city, it's our community, it's our church. And yet, even if it stands until Jesus comes back, at some point, everything you see around you will be gone. You see, all the things I mentioned, they're good gifts of God. There's a certain amount of security to be found in the people God has placed in your life, in the things that God has given you, but they are temporary. But not the rock. In the waters of your baptism, you're bolted into it through the promises of God's word. He's made you a part of it. And that rock of God's promises, they endure. And so you endure. You see, you've seen the ending. You know where this goes. You know that in the end you win. Which means, no matter what we face in the future, we can be confident. Amen.